Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Nick Fabia, D, 2, 5. Hello team. Today in the cave, I'd like to welcome Nick Fabia. Nick is one of the cast of the Chaotically Neutral podcast, a recently released Masks role-playing game actual play where Nick plays Nexus, the protege to his older brother, Sentinel. Chaotically Neutral shines a spotlight on teen supers interaction within the framework of a superpowered high school. Nick, of course, is also a fan of Young Justice and has come on the show to talk about one of my favorite topics. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Rich. It's great to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, Nick, I, I touched on a few things in the intro, but tell us a little more about who you are outside of Chaotically Neutral and uh, what you do. You're, you're a student? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a student at uh, Joliet Junior College. I'm going there for uh, game design right now, video game design. Nice. Other than that, I mean, I got a part-time job, you know. <laughs> right. Got to keep up those car payments. Uh, right, Other exactly. than that, I am currently working on a video game with... One of my friends, but it's in really early stages, so there's not a sure. whole lot there yet. I'm not surprised. I mean, if you're already in school doing video game design, I mean, that's the whole point. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you're you're doing it because you love it, and that's the way that it is. Yeah. yeah. So let's start off with some basics. So when did you first see Young Justice? Did you see it on its original run? No, I actually did not. I kind of wish I did. It was around the time when I probably could have been watching it during its original run but uh i I started watching it i think it was on netflix when it came out originally on there right just the first season yeah one of my one of my friends uh recommended it to me just and i was like "Eh, i'll check it out at some point i mean i like teen titans the original one uh so eventually i checked it out and i mean it was so much better than i thought it would be (laughs) (laughs) it was Way better than I thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. My expectations were pretty low, and it blew all of those expectations out of the water, for sure. So when the original run came on, then you would have been, what, about 14, 15, maybe? Is that it? What year did it come out? About five, five years ago, six years ago? 2010. Oh, it came out in 2011. Yeah. So I would have been uh, about, yeah, 13 or 14, so. Right. So about the same age as my co-host Emily for season two. Yeah. So when you did watch it, though, when it came out on Netflix, so what would that have been? Maybe a year ago, two years ago? I think it came out uh, uh, way before that because I remember waiting for the second season to come out on it. I know, and it, it took just, forever. Yeah, it took forever. So I think okay. it was like three years or so ago. So you were so you were still like kind of solidly in this, I mean, if you want to call it a target audience, right? You were, you know, not like the preteens looking for a show. Yeah. Like you, you were in this. You were the same age or around the same age as, you know, Kid Flash. Or yeah, pretty much. I, I, well, there was a a lot going on in my life around that time, so I didn't. I wasn't really paying attention to that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But uh, like it, even coming back to it after it already aired, it's just such a good show to watch. It's yeah, very very just i don't know how to describe it's just really good (laughs) yeah well this is the thing that's interesting to me and and talking to emily as well because i'm significantly older than both of you so when i'm watching the show i'm loving it but i'm loving it and it's to me i'm looking back on my teenage years and able to relate to some of the stuff that's going on there but as someone in my 40s (laughs) trying to relate to someone who's 30 years younger than me i have to wonder as a writer and a creator watching the show like does this reflect or, or does this connect with a modern teenage audience the way that it reflects to me? Even I mean, I was a teen in the 80s, right? Did it feel like that to you? I know you said you had a lot going on, but like... Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it did, in all honesty. Like, even like going back to watch it, I mean, I was still a teenager when I was watching it, uh, actually watching it. So, I, I mean, right, right. I, I still feel like I could connect with everything that was going on. All of the characters are like very in depth. They all seem like real people for for the most part. Right. Even even if some of them are like you know aliens or clones or whatever. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. 
there was an interview or, or something I was looking at with Greg and Greg was saying, somebody said, what would you want to take away from people watching Young Justice? And he said, uh, he said, the thing I want to take away is that they feel the characters are real. Yeah. He said, he said specifically, he said, not good, real. Doesn't mean that they're like, he wants them to feel like real people that you're watching on a screen. And I think that happened, you know, yeah. with the show. So before you started watching this, then what was your history with DC Comics? And uh, honestly, with, with, it was folded a little gaming too. Yeah. Like what's your gaming, gaming background along with your DC Comics background? Well, my, my gaming background definitely probably preceded anything with comics. I, I very... Oh, that's interesting. Co- compared to many people, I have gotten into comics very recently. I think about three years ago, me and my one of my friends, his name is David, we just were like in that big Marvel craze and we're just like, hey, let's go out and start collecting comics. Why not? <laughs> okay, uh, and let's we, do it. And we just started doing that and... Most of it was focused on Marvel uh, because my friend, he, I don't know why, but he had this thing against DC. <laughs> it's not uncommon, man. I'm telling you. I, don't, I hate to interrupt you, but I just want you to feel like it's not rare. Like we've talked to so many people who had this, this vision of what DC, yeah. what they thought DC was, that Young Justice has helped to fix. Yeah. And like, I, and I've seen that too. Like I used to have a lot of things against mostly like Superman, Flash, that sort of stuff. Like I, I always enjoyed Batman. Uh, like I used to watch the Batman animated series when I was sure. younger. That was a that was one that I saw a lot. And, uh, I mean, I always loved Batman. He 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 hated Batman, and I was like, <laughs> I was offended whenever I was like, dude, just just take this, li- read this. It's good, yeah. and he just never would. <laughs> But, uh, no, like, I started getting into those kinds of comics around that time. Usually, like, I, I'd be the only one getting any of the DC Batman comics or sure. anything. But your, but your gaming background happened significantly before that? Uh, yeah, like, I, I've been playing video games since, like, my first video games that I played were on the PS2. Mm-hmm. Like, I played Ape Escape... Uh, that sort of uh, those sort of games. I play Kingdom mm-hmm. Hearts. I know a lot. Of, there are kind of people that are. What about tabletop gaming though? Because you're in you're in you're in this actual this masks tabletop actual play yeah. now. Like, where is your where's your tabletop start? Tabletop started around the same time as my comic stuff. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. My first game that we played was I got a module for Star Wars: Edge of the Empire. Uh, That was actually the first system that I actually played all the way through. Uh, Like, we didn't finish that game. We still haven't finished that game. I wish we could. (laughs) But uh, it's one of those things where it just kind of ends up dying at some point. Yep, campaign fading. "Eh." Yep, it happens. (laughs) Other than that, uh, it it just kind of evolved from from there. Uh, I recently have not been playing in many games. I've been trying to get into more. I DM one game for a bunch of my friends online uh Mm -hmm. other otherwise it's just kind of the podcast and the one i dm yeah i mean you're in college too i mean you're got classes and and you're also working on top of that i mean there's a lot going on for sure i love the idea that like gaming online is just a thing now it's just a thing you can do and you don't have to worry about timing and distance or sometimes well you have to worry about timing but not as much (laughs) but distance you know can be an issue for a lot of people yeah which is fantastic. So, so then, since this is since your gaming background is only only a few years old, doing an actual play podcast is a lot of work, man. <laughs> I know a lot of yeah. podcasters and a lot of actual play podcasts, and it is not something you just casually decide to do on an after, or you shouldn't casually well, decide to do in an afternoon, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you, I was, we were talking off mic before the show, and you know. There's some things about Chaotically Neutral that struck me pretty immediately. Like, the chemistry between your players is really, really good. I like your characters are really interesting. I like that you've decided to focus on, like, uh, almost like a government-run Professor Xavier's, you know, school type of a thing, which I think is really interesting. And your sound quality and editing are really quite good. And these are not things that... uh, uh, These are things that normally are a problem, for podcasts right at the beginning, particularly the editing and the sound quality stuff. So can you tell us a little bit about how Chaotically Neutral came about and like how did you hit the ground running a little bit better than some other podcasts do? Yeah, well, 
I, I would say that this has been something that we've been talking about for a very long time, me and my friends. Uh, it, it originally started off where we talked about just like, why don't we just make a YouTube channel, record games, that sort right, of thing. Sure. And like we kind of, one of my friends started to do that. And then it just kind of fell through for him. And we just never really got caught on to anything. Then James, he is the DM. I, he, he's one of my good friends. And he also has DM'd a lot of the games that I've been in. Like yeah. a lot of the D&D games that we played. He just, he is currently trying to go to be a voice actor. And yeah. he thought, after listening to a lot of these other uh, podcasts and stuff... A lot of these actual plays, mainly like uh, The Adventure Zone and One Shot, like those two right, were sure. kind of the bigger inspirations for us. Uh, we, we heard those and we were like, you know, we, we enjoy playing uh, tabletop games and we have some equipment and we know how to use it. Why not, you know, try it out, see where it goes? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of where it came from, from just like... It it was kind of a, like a pick up pick up this sort of stuff, but I mean we did take time to make sure that we knew what we were doing beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, it, it comes across on on aspects of the the tech part of the show for sure, and that that stuff that that stuff that I I, I like to see when somebody puts some thought into stuff before they just hit the ground, right? And and just yeah. throw yeah like throw something up. You know what I mean? Because lots of other things can develop down the line, right? You can you you're you're going to improve no matter what kind of podcast you're putting out. Your first episodes are not going to be probably what you want them to be, and particularly after you've done a hundred, and you're going to look back and you're going to be have improved so much over time. And so, I don't usually hold it against a podcast, but it always jumps out at me when a podcast like yours start hits the ground running on stuff like that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we're we're honestly like we're really surprised how like how crazy it's been thus far. I mean, we didn't expect any, anything to even come out of this. We were like, Oh, we'll see what happens. We'll kind of keep going. And if anything happens, well, that's, that's cool. Yep. But I mean, we kind of even lightly blew up at this point, uh, <laughs> especially within like the, within the masks, AP sphere, at least. I mean, it's kind of a small sphere, but it's been slowly growing. And, yep. uh, I mean, like you got other other podcasts that even just started popping up, such as like Protein City Comics just started. And Protein City's fantastic, man. The guys from Stop Pack and Roll are amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really really good thus far. I actually like I just joined their Discord chat, and they're pretty cool, pretty cool guys. So no, they're great. Yeah, Brendan Leon Gambetta is actually working with me on a game right now, and he's fantastic. So uh, good stuff. And Nerds on a Roll is great. And I just I yeah. see them more going out. You know, the Mask is a great game, and it's perfect for. You know, people like our fans who love Young Justice. So yeah. So when we, when we started talking about having you on the show, the topic that came up was, as I said at the beginning of the show, one of my favorite things, which is developing character, both on the screen and on the table, role playing game wise. So from the point of view of developing character, what is it about Young Justice that jumps out at you as being different? than other shows i mean it's just that they all feel like real people i mm -hmm. mean usually whenever you're watching a cartoon it's just very stereotypical like oh this person does this be oh that's because they're a teenager that's why they do this there's no other reason for it there's no, no, like, mo no motivating factor outside of yeah they like it, it, with this they took uh, like greg weissman and brandon vietti they took the time to sit down and think about why would a character eventually do this or what would this thing have an effect on like their future personality or like pretty much how would they have become this person? Right, right. Is there a particular, like what characters jump out? At, I mean, it, it happens across the board. We, again, we were talking about this off mic, but what characters jump out at you, like you personally and specifically that jump out at you that, either that you relate to or maybe not relate to, but that jumped out at you as something you maybe either hadn't seen before or... Uh, I feel like particularly I'd say something like Kid Flash, Magan, and Superboy. Uh, I think yeah. those were very good examples. I mean, obviously, like 
also with Robin and that sort of stuff. I, I've always enjoyed Robin as a character. I know you you do too, as you've spoken about. Many I don't know times. what you're talking about. I don't know anything about Robin. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, pretty much. It's so hard to choose between any of them because they they all have really great character yeah. development. But in, not necessarily choosing, but like you know, when I was watching the show, I was shocked by how much character development happened with, say, Connor. Yeah. Right. I had a. I felt really bad about myself with my first impressions of Connor. Like, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to handle angsty, angst, angsty teen guy. Super for, angst. Yeah. For four. Am I going to get four seasons of this? Because this is going to be tough, right? Yeah. Of course, by like episode five and six, we're start, already starting to see growth and development in his character. Mm -hmm. So as much as I liked Robin and who Robin is as a character you know, characters. And like you were saying, like McGann too, like McGann, I didn't know what was going on with this character. And then her arc is phenomenal. Just phenomenal. It gets better. Like as it goes on, like it, it, you would think that by the end of season one, her arc was over, but it does, it doesn't no. stop there. Yep. The se season two, it gets even, it gets even crazier. And I'm right. just like, she did what with her powers? Right, what, right. What's going on? And that's the thing. Like you're talking about this reality feeling, this feeling of realness. There isn't a point in your life where you go, oh, okay, well, I'm done developing now. Yeah. This is who I am, right? It, trust me. You got I, 27 more years on you. It still doesn't <laughs> happen. It doesn't happen. Hopefully you become more free with like expressing who you feel you are which is an example of from say Connor, right? Yeah. His character, his character when he's starting off, he's like, "Oh, I was told I'm either a hero or a weapon. I'm trying to figure out which of these things I'm supposed to be, right?" Until he figures out that those 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 templates that were offered to him were offered to him by somebody else, not him, and that he can be whatever he wants to be or he can be allowed to be whoever he wants to be. Yeah. And the his drama and conflict in the developing of his character came not from figuring out whether he was a hero or a weapon. It came from dismissing both of those things and just allowing himself to shine alone, like just because of what he wants. And um, I think I think in a lot of shows, they don't do that. They, the characters do, like you're saying, like the characters do what the author wants them to do. Yeah. They do what the scriptwriter wants them to do. And when people call them on how it doesn't seem right, their answer is, oh, it's a show about superheroes with superpowers. Why are you questioning this? Or, oh, they're just teenagers. They don't make sense anyway. Or yeah. whatever stupid excuse that they make, right? Yeah. Because, like, it, it, it's like a thing with role-playing games as well. Like, uh, like a lot of the times in the campaign, in, like, my Dungeons & Dragons campaign that I did uh, with James as the DM. Right. We He would always pre present us with answer A and answer B in a lot of these situations. And somehow everyone in the room would create an option C because yes. the, we can, we know we're, we're not robots. We don't just do something because you present it to us. If we right. can find another way, we'll find another way. Like, and that's the same thing with character characters. And, and that, such. that's what's interesting to me about comparing things like a, a TV show, like young justice to a, a tabletop role-playing game to video game. Right. So yep. this video game developing thing I want to touch on a little bit too because, you know, we're, we're used to in, in or at least the early part of video games where you're, you know, you're, you're bouncing around with Mario or whatever and you have a couple of choices and that's what you have. We're starting to get to things like that are getting more and more full of choice and it's this illusion of choice within a very large sandbox. Like say, you know, Bioware games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age where you have an absolutely... Um, insane number of choices and character development options where you can play the game over and over and over again and make different choices, different moral choices yeah. in many cases that will affect how the story you see. Mass Effect, the first one had at least three endings. Oh, yeah. uh, the old Knights of the Old Republic, that was one of the first games that they did, was fantastic. And it had three endings, depending on how you morally chose the light side, the dark side, or light side halfway through and then flip the dark side <laughs> during yeah. a key moment right yeah amazing like there were choices in that game that made me want to go take a shower afterwards like i was like i don't uh i made that choice to see what would happen and i don't like any of that that's yeah. in, in a good way not like 
a gross way, but a way that was like, oh, I see how somebody would make this choice. And that's what makes it uncomfortable, right? Those good moral questions. So pulling that kind of experience back to a television show like Young Justice, it's like you're saying this, it's not an A or a B, like Superman, Superboy doesn't have an A or a B choice. McGann doesn't have an A or a B choice, right? She can choose to be whoever she wants. The problem is you have to get over that barrier kind of in your mind. Right, exactly. She wants to be Megan Morse. Yeah. But even though the show eventually lets her kind of be Megan Morse, she still doesn't end up being Megan Morse. Yeah, no, she she eventually just kind of becomes herself and she realizes, it, it, at least from what I can tell, like she kind of realizes that she can be herself right. uh, in a lot of these situations. So... Right, I absolutely agree. So McGann, Connor, and who else did you say? Oh, Kid Flash. That was yeah, an Kid interesting Flash. choice. So why why did Kid Flash jump out at you? Because he well, first off, I I love the Flash just in general. He's like I, I really like the the CW show, maybe apart from some of the more, you know, CW aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed the Flash as a character, and Kid Flash just in the show stands out to me because he, he starts off as a very erratic character, very jokey all the time. Doesn't seem like he's really paying much attention to what, what's actually going on. Right, but right. then like specifically, I think it was the episodes cold heart. I yeah. Cold hearted, cold hearted. Yeah. I very much enjoy that episode. Cause that's one of the episodes where you see like, he's not just always going to be joking and stuff. He has, emotion more than that and you can yeah. act and it affects him throughout the series as you kind of see like he eventually starts becoming closer to artemis even though he's always fighting with her right right now, like you kind of see a progression in his character as like he meets artemis he has to then later has to abandon going on one of the big fighting missions so that he can just save someone save right. a, a young girl who it did turn out to be a princess, but still. <laughs> right, right, exactly. No, I hear you. Like, he's he's the character who loves being a hero. He wasn't yeah. forced into it. The accident happened to him, or in this case, he recreated the accident. Well, yeah, he, he, he did it himself. <laughs> right, right. So he kind of maybe made the choice, but he loves being a hero. It's just like cold-hearted reminded him what a hero is actually like. Yeah. Right? And, and once he kind of remembered that, then he takes that very seriously, right? We yeah. talk about, um, we had just, we've just released the, uh, as of this recording, uh, our review of Summit. And in Summit, Impulse, he, Kid Flash tells Impulse he would like to retire and he wants Impulse to take over that mantle. Yeah. But Impulse is way more powerful than Wally is. Like, his powers are much more... And he's young, and he's still got... He's got more of the powers that Barry has than Wally does. Yeah. Yet, Impulse is so honored by this offering of what that means, that he would take that mantle, that Kid Flash mantle from Wally. And yeah. it's it shows so much of who Wally is as a character that he would earn that much respect, yeah. you know, from someone who was giving him such a hard time not very many episodes ago about his power level and whatnot. Yeah. And I mean, like, especially when he very clearly realizes that impulse is better than him. He's kind of able to I admit that more. So it seems. Right. And he just keeps being a hero. He doesn't, I mean, he's okay. You know, it's gotta be frustrating for him, but he doesn't stop doing what he's doing. Right. Yeah. Also, when I say, also, when I say better, I mean, you know, power-wise, because... Right. He has more, <laughs> more, more powers. More well, he's just a better heroic. person in general. Just, just ignore Wally. <laughs> Don't ignore Wally. Don't do it. <laughs> so, is there something, when you're talking about character development, not just how the, how the show works, but like you were mentioning that you've watched some of the other, the other shows on TV that involve some of these characters. Do you see parallels? Do you see ways that these other shows either maybe don't do things quite as well or they do it better in some ways or where do you where do you where do you think young justice separates itself from your average superhero tv show well i i feel like with, with young justice they tend it tends to go more in depth with the reasoning and sort of stuff like very subtle reasoning but you can see where all of this 
character development is coming from rather than being like, oh, this happened to him a long time ago and you never get to see that. Right. Um, it, it, with Young Justice, you see everything that's happening and all of the decisions that led to how this character became this character. Right. But then, like, in a lot of a lot of shows, they just have the character traits that are just there just because. I'd bring up, say, like, the Arrow CW show where mm -hmm. Ollie is always doubting himself no matter what in every situation, even though... Oh, right. I see, yeah. It's kind of like... I feel like at this at, at some point you got to just be like, look, I, I I make mistakes, but it just like I, I do my best to get out of them. But right. it, it always seems like they in a lot of shows, they just focus on very specific character tropes and don't really get over them. Uh, right. Whereas in Young Justice, they do have some of those, but the characters are able to overcome them in a way that makes sense and they don't keep reverting back to that right the one thing i really liked about the first and into the second season of arrow as an example i i, I avoided that show like the plague i didn't yeah. want to watch it at all i saw the premiere episode at comic-con san diego comic-con here and i saw him like murder a couple people and i was just like whoa what is yeah. this and then, so I just, I didn't watch it. And then I had a very, very good friend of mine who's a huge DC Comics fan. Um, she's amazing. And she told me, she just said one thing. She was all longbow hunters. And I was like, wait, what? And longbow hunters is a mini series from back in the 80s that redefined Green Arrow and who he is. And it was fantastic. And they've clearly drawn a lot of things from that comic arc. It, the character of Shadow is from that miniseries. And so it what she was saying wasn't, oh, they're doing longbow hunters. What she was saying was like, if you loved and know what longbow hunters are, you're going to love this show. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no way that they did that yeah. good. Right? And she said yeah. also that character you see early on in the Arrow first season is not the character he is at the beginning of the second season. Like, he starts off this almost kind of understandable survivalist killer. We haven't seen all of his island story arc yet. But oh, then yeah. at the beginning of the second season, he's he's at least working with this idea of not killing, right? That of doing yeah. some other, being a different kind of hero. That I really appreciated. But as the, they got into season three and season four, and I think they're on season five now, yeah. I also started to see this repetition, like you're talking about, of... But well, wait, what about those six lessons you learned in season three? Like, where yeah. did they go? I feel like you're just you're retconning or dismissing a thing that I watched. And now I'm wondering why I watched it. Yeah. And like the first two seasons were were pretty good. And in, in all honesty, I mean, it's just like the longer it went on, it, it kind of felt it did just start kind of re repeating itself in the ways right. in like the reasoning for why things keep happening or like in the first season of the flash it honestly like i loved it it was, it was so fantastic good. i thought all it was great of, all of the uh characters were really good i, I mean there was some kind of uh, obviously as i said before i'm not into as much of like the really cw ish stuff like we're sure it's like a typical romantic comedy-esque stuff sometimes yeah but uh, overall, it was a very good comic book series, and it kind of continued to be that. But then again, I feel like the Barry Allen and that started falling into the same pattern that Ollie did, where he's like he's always doubting himself now, or making the same mistakes, or having the same conversations with his friends. Yeah. Doesn't always happen, but I don't disagree with you, and I think that's a that's a uh, a, a trope. A, yeah. A, a pitfall that that many many shows fall into where and this is where i think my whole superboy thing came from because when i saw him being angsty teen guy i was like oh he's gonna be angsty teen guy forever that was my assumption i had no expectation that they were going to change why would i have why i have no frame of reference for character development in in an yeah. animated series like once you create a character who's like this and if people really like it for three seasons why are you going to change that character, right? From a production standpoint or like a money-making standpoint, I get why the pressure would be on to do the same things that had people drawn to the show. Yeah, of course. 
but the addition of the timestamps in Young Justice, an actual passage of time, is something that, I mean, it barely happens in the live action shows we're talking about. Like, okay. there's almost like this illusion that time hasn't quite passed. Like, everybody's yeah. kind of the same. Like, there's a, there's a meta plot for the season, but it's almost like this whole show's still episodic. Yeah. It just, like, it feels like it's almost always the same week, almost. Uh, <laughs> right. So... Right. And when we're talking about Young Justice, and let's move in. We talked a lot about season one. Let's talk about season two a little bit, though. All right. Because you have a character, you have characters like, I don't know. So why don't you, why don't you th- throw me one of your yeah. favorite characters from the season two cast? I very much enjoy Beast Boy. Yeah. Beast Boy, Blue Beetle. I do, even though he's not in there for that long, uh, Static Shock. Oh, yeah, for sure. I can't wait to see more Static. I, I hope to see more. Uh, who else? Uh, just... All of the characters from the first season in the way that they're portrayed in the second season is really great. Yeah. I mean, I, I got I they got me every time those like crazy twists happened when I was first watching it. Like, yeah, for sure. Where I, I was like, I mean, if Calder really turned, I mean, I'm sure that there's some good reason because I, I just had that kind of trust with them at that point. I was like, there has to be a good reason for this. But then Very I find point. out that he actually didn't. And it's like, right. well, all right. All right, then. <laughs> But here's the thing, too, like, it, all right, let's say I want to talk about Beast Boy, but let's take it back to Calder. You brought Calder up. So, like, yeah. so you have Calder. We think he's a traitor. Or he had some reason to leave the team. Even when you are thinking, I can't believe that he's a traitor. He's got to be undercover. Like, it's the first thing you're going to say, right, as a viewer. Yeah. They kept making him have to do things that made it so that even if he wasn't a traitor and he was undercover, it was going to affect him for the rest of his life. The final scene in Summit, where he find, where he beats his dad, right? He beats down Manta, yeah. and everybody's like, congratulations, you won. And he glances over his shoulder and looks at his dad. He's just beaten into unconsciousness. And the look on his face where he's like, where he just moments before, he's like, I've seen the nobility in you, Right. And yeah. unlike Sportsmaster, who is like the worst ever, Black Manta clearly loved his son, right? And so it's this, it becomes a complicated bit of character development. Like, you know, that carrying it into the next season, those things that happened to Calder, even though that he wasn't a traitor, quote unquote, aren't going to be necessarily dismissed out of hand, right? Yeah. Those things are going to be considered, you know? before they make decisions on what Calder may or may not do for that next season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I, I want to talk about Beast Boy for a minute, because you brought up Beast Boy. Yeah. And here's the thing that I noticed is the idea that these there's such an ensemble cast, right? Yet every one of these characters feels so rich and real, like you were saying. And some of these things are caught in little, literal like 30 second or 60 second scenes, Right. And with Beast Boy, it's the one where he's on Ran in the jungle. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that was probably one of my favorite scenes of that season. Like, because you, it's only, a, as you said, like 30 seconds, but you see him like change back to his like normal Garfield form. And it's just like, mm-hmm. you see that small bit of flashback and you already know what happened because it's like and it makes you feel for him yeah within 30 seconds and that is incredible to do in any any entertainment medium if you only have 30 seconds it's particularly for a character who had one one episode in the first season out of 26 and people may not even have realized that you know that was the same character Right. And then he's got a little bit of time in the first episode. And I think this was the second episode. Mm -hmm. So like in the second episode and you already feel for this character in such a quick way with literally like you count it all together, maybe seven minutes of screen time between two seasons. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) And you already love this kid and care for this kid and worry about this kid and think about all of the potential consequences of the depth of the problems this poor kid has. I mean, it might also be my my love of the character in general because I mean, I watched Teen Titans when it was when it was on TV, and that was 
I, I loved that show. Beast Boy is one of my favorite characters in that as well. So, I mean, seeing that yeah. also, like, it leaves an even greater impact if you're familiar with the character just in general. So Yeah, he was one of my favorites growing up, reading the Teen Titans back in the 80s. He and, he and Nightcrawler are very similar characters in that aspect where they're, they're characters who are uh, cannot be easily passed off as a normal human without soup without powers yeah so they have to they have to find a way to deal and in both cases both of those characters deal with kind of sometimes gallows humor but humor you know they they turn to the lighter side of who they are as as people and try to turn away from an emphasis on their visual like aspects of relationships you know because they're both such so such good characters at heart. Yeah. Right? That get across, you know, uh, on the screen so well. And they did the same thing with Superman. That one quick moment where he's trying to save the Krolataeans. Mm-hmm. And the, the island blows up, gets nuked. Yeah. Like, I, I saw that and I was just like, when I first watched it, I'm like, holy crap. Like, he, he tried... But he, they just wouldn't listen, and it, it, it's almost like it, it's a a small tragedy right there. Like, yeah, it, it it portrays Superman's character really well, like in situations like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and though I'm not the biggest Superman uh, fan, I do understand the various like good Superman stories. Like, and it's always when he can't save someone or when he right. has to deal with that sort of thing. And and I love that they were able to add that in here. Right, the moral consequence. So we've talked about how the the kinds of things that the character development jumps out at us uh, from Young Justice. But now I want to talk a little bit about, like, what can we learn from this and what techniques can we learn from this? And we, we talk about quite a bit of it in the show from a writing standpoint, but I'm kind of interested in how they talk about the approach from a video game development standpoint going into the future of video games. I mean, I, I was around when, you know, yeah. I had an old Atari with Berserk and Evil Auto bouncing across the screen back in the day. So I've seen significant improvement. Uh, I just finished playing XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. That game is mind-blowing. It's so great. Destiny 2 came out. It's fantastic. Like, things oh, yeah. are changing a lot. And even with those games, like in XCOM 2, for example, that game is... It's a strategy game. It's a strategy and resource management game, but they actually have a lot of ways to get character onto the screen. For example, they have this bonding mechanic now between your your soldiers, and of course you can personalize your soldiers, just what they look like, what they're wearing, and it's almost impossible not to overlay some kind of personality on them, some story on them passively, even mm-hmm. in a strategy game. But then you're talking about other games like like we were talking about, like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, where you can play the game with a different kind of character uh, so many different ways, not just different mechanics, like say, you know, a, a biotic, telekinetic, or magic user versus like a fighter, but different moral choices and that kind of thing. Do they talk much about that? Like, have you have you read much about that? Or, or amongst the people that do video games with you, do you talk much about like where that is going? Well... At the moment, uh, none of the classes that I've really been in have talked much about that. I mean, I have my own. I have, I do have my own opinions on that. I, I've always been a story guy when it comes to video games, and right. I mean, there's usually like two different. I can't say just two, but like there's like two camps that you would think of in the majority, where there's like people who are, play a game for the story. There's a pe- people who play the game for the gameplay, and I'm kind of leaning more towards the story end yeah i play a lot of rpgs uh like i I started playing divinity original sin 2 just came out that's a great game and throughout that kind of stuff though it's not always amazing like the characters aren't always written perfectly in a lot of these games but depending on you know where you want to go in a game I feel like it, it, I don't know where I'm going with this. Um. <laughs> no, think it through, because I'm totally I'm I'm really interested in in kind of particularly in early development for video games. So I have quite a few friends who work in the video game industry, and they've worked on a variety of things from you know Fallout New Vegas and EverQuest and you know that kind of stuff. They've been around yeah. for a while and seen those changes in development. 
but I mean, they're my age, so they've been working in it for a really long time. And I'm interested in how the things that they learned and developed over time are now baseline, right? Yeah. They're taken for granted in development now. And I think, I feel like one of those things is better, more interesting characters or even just voice work. We're talking about the voice work of characters like Nolan North, for example, oh, who yeah. does the voice of Superboy. He's in, he's all over the place. Yeah, he's uh, everywhere. Crispin, Crispin Freeman does, you know, voices on Overwatch. And so there's definitely this crossover of animation, storytelling and skilled actors. Yeah, right? actually into- uh, with Overwatch, you bring that up. Uh, yeah. That is a game, very obviously, that is a game. But somehow, they made it so that people can come to it and not just love the game, but they love the characters. And that's what I... They give backstory to every single character, and the way that they act in-game reflects the backstory that they have. And, And... you pick up a character and you... Give me, a, give me an example, actually, because I've seen Overwatch. I know a little bit about it, but I haven't played it yet. And I have friends, like my friends on the One Shot Network, they're monstrous Overwatch fans. Yeah. Can you give me an example of like one of the characters and, and their backstory and kind of how it feeds into the actual gameplay action uh, activity of the game? Yeah, like, say, uh, Winston, for instance. He's a giant gorilla with a, with a Tesla cannon, pretty much. And you look at that and you're like, oh, that's kind of silly and stuff. But And that's the character that Crispin voices, right? Does he? I think he I does. I think he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah I but, think he does, um, yeah. But yeah, like you, you look at that and you're like, oh, there's nothing to it. But like all of his, his entire backstory, as far as I'm aware, is that he was raised on the moon to be like, he was an intelligent ape kind of thing. Almost like Planet of the Apes, it, like the okay. new one. And the scientist that he worked with, that worked with him, was very influential on him until there was, like, an, some sort of uprising. I mean, all of the stories in this are really absurd and kind of Very weird. superhero-y. Yeah, Very yeah. superhero-y and obviously aren't going to be super realistic. But, like, apparently he lost him. Like, he was... I The uh, scientist was killed or something similar. I'm okay. not... I'm not a hundred percent on all of the lore with this, so that's okay. Um, just the just the big over over overview is good. Yeah, and eventually, like he came to find companionship while being in the Overwatch crew, pretty much. And after everything went down, and Overwatch was disbanded after the war with the Omnix, or whatever it was, something like that. Right. Uh, eventually, he lost all of those connections that he. F- like, because he felt like a family with them. Right. And whenever, and finally in Overwatch, when whatever happens, happens, because they never really explain what brings them together for a second time, he is very excited to be actually with everyone again. And all the interactions between the characters when you're playing, like, because they talk with each other and stuff during the game, yeah. you can see that he's just, like, really happy to be with them most of the time. And it, it's just a cool thing. But it's but it's really at it, at its heart, Overwatch, and I'm oversimplifying, but Overwatch is a first person shooter, right? It's yeah, basically it's, you're running around and and yeah, gunning gunning down that's villains all it is. and it's teamwork. All it is, really. Right. It's just a first person shooter, but somehow it it's able to make you feel for the characters, and it brings you back, be like partially because the characters are fun to play, and you know you know them a bit after playing them. Right. And and they all seem to be so unique that there's something that draws a player to to a character, not just its power set necessarily, but also perhaps relating in some way or enjoying the the personality of a particular character, right? Yeah. And when we're talking about ensemble cast, like pulling it back to Young Justice, the character development doesn't happen in a vacuum, and that's where it's like you're not talking about a single character. You're talking about a team of characters that are all constantly changing and moving forward, and their changes affect other people as well. And in the case of Young Justice, just even, for example, parentage, just talking about parentage, right? So Robin's adopted, his parents were killed. Wally's in a very happy, multi-generational family. Artemis is from a broken home with criminal parents. Like, everybody has their own thing, Right? Like, McGann comes from a huge family but doesn't fit in. Like, a a Mm -hmm. huge mixed-race family that doesn't fit in. Feels like she doesn't fit in even in in her own home. There's something for everyone to relate to. And then, in addition to that, 
which gives them a real foundation for you to relate to yeah. them. And then as they change, those changes are ignited, I guess, by that good foundation we're talking about that they feel real, that nothing started off, like you were saying at the beginning, nothing starts off with, oh, they just do it because they're a teenager. Yeah. No, you know why they feel the way they feel, right? Yeah. It, like with Superboy, he he starts off, he's a clone. He just awoke and i'm sure like that they explain kind of some of the reasoning why he even has some of the anchors because making a kryptonian just by themselves makes their mind kind of like broken in it just right. their psyche is everywhere so he's not able to really control himself it's just animalistic instinct so he's kind of fighting against that throughout the entire series right and and that's kind of why he's doing it not just teen ang- angst it's not necessarily who he wants to be. He just doesn't know how to do anything else. And his horm- the hormone system, speaking biologically, yeah. his hormone system has even got to be more out of whack between having a human and Kryptonian you know, organs and hormones affecting his mind. As know. well as being constantly the same age. So Yeah, which is a whole different thing. Like Internally, just externally, he looks the same. Internally, yeah. he seems to be aging. At least that's what he thinks is happening. Yeah that's, yeah, that's what he keeps saying. So interesting. I mean, it's interesting to me. All right, so um, in in relation to what we're talking about here, the video games, we're talking about a little bit yeah. role playing games and and Young Justice. When you're moving forward with what you want to do as far as video gaming is concerned, and you're talking about the story focus of video gaming, are there any like parallels of things that you're pulling from a show like Young Justice or other shows, either of what you like or don't like? that you'd like to see kind of folded into the kind of the future of video game design? Yeah, I mean, I I always enjoy, as I said, I always enjoy good story. And I I always, with the games that I want to create, eventually, I do want to incorporate a lot of that, like, the, the very, the characters that change over time and that you'll be able to see why things are happening more so because then you'll be able to connect with the characters and you'll be able to connect with the story more rather than just being like, oh, I just killed 500 people throughout this entire game playing through Skyrim or something. It's just like, I killed an entire town. What of it? (laughs) Right, exactly. Like, there's no consequence. or Yeah, like, I want to make a game where there has consequence. I mean, some of the early games that, like, I'm working on with my friends right now is more of like very indie titles and not and like more like 2D fun games as far as sure. we're doing right now which is great to do it's really fun uh but eventually I want to get to that sort of point where I'm able to create you know some kind of spanning story that pe- people can actually really get invested in because that's yeah. the sort of sort of stuff that I'm really into and I know that there are other people out there that would also enjoy that Absolutely. And I think even with these like, like iOS games, these like 2D, like I- iOS, it's old school, it's got side scrollers, the whole deal. There are still ways that I've seen people make me invested in this character mm-hmm. that may not even have any lines, right? Like something about their actions or how they move yeah. or what they, how they react to certain things, how they look, there are ways to drive those things or how the mechanics work and feed into yeah. how they do what they do. Or, uh, like, an example of that sort of thing is, like, uh, Undertale, if you've ever played that or heard much about that. It it was an indie hit kind of last year. Oh, I have heard of this. My nephew told yeah. me about it, and he couldn't stop talking about it. It's such... It, it, it's that kind of game that I kind of wish that... I, I, I hope that I can create at some point. Right. It has a lot of character, uh, though... Not in the same way that it would be in Young Justice. Like, one of the other things with characters, as far as I can tell, bet- like the differences between a uh, like a series, and uh, like a uh, film or a television series and a video game, is sometimes the characters don't have to always be changing. If you can lock on to a really good archetype sometimes, then yeah. they, can, uh, they can also, you can also get attached to that. Uh, yeah. Like one of the characters is literally making puns and joking throughout the entire thing, but does have kind of a darker side that shows up every once in a while. And it, but he's an endearing character and that's, right, right. but that's kind of like throughout, throughout most of undertale. That's really what 
pulls most people as well as myself in is all of the characters are written very well to mm-hmm. the point where like you don't have to see where they came from but they're just fun characters that you would be like I don't I don't want to I don't want to hurt this character. I don't want to fight this character. He's cool. I want him to be my friend. Right, you know? right, right. Giving you an emotional investment and taking you on that emotional ride yeah. with the character. Yeah, I love it. And I absolutely want to see more of that in video games moving forward. Yeah. So thanks so much for spending time with us in the cave, Nick. Where can, where can people find you out here on Earth Prime? People can find me over on Twitter uh, at the True Dark Wolf, uh, as well as uh, you can find the chaotically neutral channel itself at chaotically cast on twitter i'm usually on there pretty much every day if you shoot us like a message or something i mean Mm -hmm. i'll probably respond pretty quickly also you can check us out on itunes google play whatever your favorite podcatcher is uh we got five episodes up right now so yeah it's uh it's early on in the in this show so it's uh it's uh it's always a good spot to jump on when you can get on a little bit earlier and, and see how you feel yeah, and we got we post every other week, every other Friday. So awesome. Well, thanks to everyone else for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website crashingthemode.com. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.